Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Ido Cedar. Ido is the founder of Anitra, which is a company that makes a wearable device to help control stress and anxiety. Ido, welcome to the pod. Hi, Spencer. It's great to be here. Uh, it was nice chatting with you before, and I'm looking forward to doing the real thing. Likewise. Yeah, no, excited to have you on. Uh, for people listening, Ido and I just met last week uh, through Gal Imbar, who uh, was introduced by Brian ba Beyer. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Gal's awesome. I mean, he introduced me to you and two other guys from Israel. And uh, I don't know, I'm definitely, uh, you know, it seems like there's chemistry and, uh, you know, Anitra is such a cool product. And so I'm kind of interested in talking more about, you know, your journey to how you got there, what it does, some of your background. Um, some of this will be refresher from what we talked about last time, but then I'm sure we'll go down some conversational tangents and learn some new stuff about each other as well. Great. So I guess for people listening, uh, what is Anitra? Okay, so Anitra uh, is a wearable that uh, uses uh, uh, the person's breathing uh, to help them stay calm and connected uh, in any situation through their day. Uh, so using, uh, using the breath is not a new thing, uh, using the breath to relax or to stay calm or balanced, let's say, present, is not a new thing. It's being used either by, by some th therapists and, and trainers, uh, controlling the breath, slowing down the breath, a leng a lengthening the, the exhale, uh, in this way controlling blood the chemistry and, and also using focus. And the the other side of that is mindfulness mindfulness training uh, mindfulness training meditation training uh, uses the breath to f to help focus um, the attention um, in the in the body um, as a preparation for going in for 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 uh, doing a body scan or other techniques that are out there so all of these techniques uh, using the breath uh, uh, are using the breath. And what we do is we help the, the person uh, implement uh, these techniques on the go while in the situation when there's no teacher or therapist next to them. Uh, um, and then, and then you know, it's a real, real life situation. That's interesting. So, I mean, I've, you know, tried meditation from time to time and always been pretty abysmal at it. Um, and so I guess I, I have so many questions, but... One I want to ask is, um, I guess, how does it work exactly? Like meditation in general and somatic, you know, therapy and what exactly are you doing to the brain or to the body to, to get the desired effect just from someone that's never really been able to hack it? Mm -hmm. Right. So our focus, uh, the, the device uh, uses a few principles. So first of all, it's the connection to your breathing. Yeah. You can either just uh, use the device to, to be more in touch with your breathing. Uh, and as that happens, uh, research shows and experience shows that, that already something starts regulating in your breathing. So just being aware of it just changes something in the feedback loop of breathing brain. Okay? And that already in itself starts to lower uh, uh, stress levels. Okay. And then... And then the other thing that what we do is we create we do that by generating soothing vibrations on the body in very in very uh, um, uh, like special per, uh, centers like on the center line of the body where a lot of the time we would people would say i feel one way or another i feel this or i have an emotion of that then that's usually where they feel it is along the center of their body in their in their belly you know like butterflies being excited before a uh, uh, a date, let's say, or something exciting, yeah. uh, uh, you, you would feel butterflies in your belly, or or uh, or you feel love, or you feel you know, or, or anger, you would feel maybe around the chest more. And different people, it's very idiosyncratic, uh, very subjective. Different people will feel their emotions in different places. And so the fact that we have we have uh, uh, our device along along this line, and and it's and and you know, you can. Uh, I mean, this is a prototype, of course. Uh, we're not we're not yet selling. It's a prototype, but it's a fully operational working prototype. Um, so the fact that we have that we're generating soothing vibrations on the body in a, a centers that uh, of, uh, that are more pronounceable uh, with the emotions uh, uh, also creates a, a sort of relaxation. 
like some people uh, image, imagine it like a, a cat that's uh, uh, like sitting, a cat sitting on you and, yep. and uh, I forgot the name for it. Um, purring? Uh, purring, thank you. No uh, a cat purring on your body, synchronized with your breathing. So you get, a, you get the effect of the breathing and the awareness of the breathing, you get the effect of the soothing vibration. And basically it helps you ground in your body and in, your, and in the here and now. Okay, so it, it, it sounds like the focus, and I'm, again, I want to make sure I'm fully understanding this, and maybe I won't today, and that's okay. But it sounds like it's, it's focusing on the present. Is, is that a way to distract yourself from the thing that's causing you stress, or more so a way to just have grounding to something else that you know is always going to be there, at least you know, unless you know, your heart rate stops for whatever reason, which is your bodily function, or both, or not either? I guess just to just to make sure I'm following, and then yeah, so, obviously I want to get into how the device does it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so again, you 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 can look at it in two different ways. You can look at it as something that's distracting you from what's bothering you, but the question or or, or grounding you in something else that is a bit more pleasant uh, than than your 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 feelings or your racing mind. Now, the thing is that what what is and that's a kind of maybe a philosophical or Buddhist question in a way, that what is disturbing us? Is it really uh, uh, the thing that we're thinking of that's disturbing us or it's our own thoughts around it and our imagination? That of, tracks. Or let's say catastrophical thinking or rumination, depending on, on, on how you look at it, uh, that, that we get around our stressor, which is what is causing us to get stressed about it. Yeah, that makes a lot and of when sense. We're, yeah, and, and when so if we are really practiced and trained and aware and we're doing our meditations and we're doing our training and really following a specific guideline or teacher or a course, then we can catch ourselves, oh, there's that trigger coming up again. Here I'm going into my thinking, uh, racing mind again, getting all worked up on this. And now if I can just uh, stop it um, uh, and then and then uh, uh, just realize, okay, I'm, I'm breathing, I'm here and now, everything is okay, no catastrophe is happening, maybe I don't have to race and get all excited about this. And then, um, uh, uh, and then you, you um, uh, by, with our device, our device helps you do that yeah. with less effort. So it takes less of your, of your consciousness uh, to focus on your breathing and the here and now and everything, and then you, don't, you cannot deal with the things that you need to deal with at the moment. So that for makes example, a lot of sense. I'm, so, for example, if I'm, I'm I'm here with you in the podcast and, and, and I'm aware that 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 maybe a lot of people are listening to me and maybe you know I should be I should be aware of what I'm saying and not saying you know all, all like and, and starting to feel a little bit um, empty or um, and then I say okay uh, 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 I feel the pain like the, the the stuffiness in my chest my my mind starts like the energy starting going to my brain my brain starts to want to calculate things etc. And if I just, if I just, uh, uh, if I have the vibration on my body, and I can remember my breathing, and I can breathe through that, then I can be much more present and and more relaxed, and and being able to to flow, and dance with reality, if you like. Yeah, that I makes hope a that lot wasn't sense. too far far like philosophical. No, no, no. I was just trying to understand and kind of get my head into it. And I remember thinking before the first time we talked, I mean, if if you can create a device that actually reduces anxiety you know i mean that's that's huge i mean so many people you know will i mean i mean there's tons of ways people try to deal with it but i mean i would say a ton of people struggle with that i don't know the statistics i'm sure you do because you've pitched it and gotten funding <laughs> <laughs> so, um but i mean yeah it's it's just difficult to believe right like the cynical engineer in me wants to say you can't do that with a device you know but then the more you start to explain it and talk about anecdotally and, and talk about the theory, the more that even a cynical bastard like me goes, oh, that actually seems pretty great, you know? And so that's, that's kind of why I, I was asking those questions. And I, yeah. I think you did a good job sort of explaining it. I, I totally understand. Uh, and, and you know, the thing is that we're, we're not, uh, anybody that claims that they are making something that will magically stop all your problems or, or, or all your anxieties or stressors, uh, that would be a lie because uh, uh, there's nothing like that. Not even the best medication uh, can do that. And, and if it does, it usually has a lot of side effects uh, that yeah. go along uh, along with it. Like you can really, really, 
you know, make yourself really relaxed, but then you won't be, you won't be able to do anything. And, um, and so what, what, we, what we aim to say, our, our, our statement is, you know, life is full of stress, especially modern life, especially being connected to so many sources of information. So you get, you get triggered a lot more than, than what we used to when we had just the phone line or, and one, like in Israel, one TV channel. And, not, you know, now we are surrounded, we're bombarded by, by information. And, 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 you know, it's a more competitive world. Uh, there's kind of a feeling that if you don't do your best 100% all the time, do the right thing and say the right thing and wear the right thing and know the right people, you're going to get left behind very, very quickly. Uh, and and so, so this, there is stress in the world. And then the question is, um, what can you use to stay in what we call, and that's uh, uh, Daniel Steele uh, coined this term, your window of tolerance. So it's not that you're, you know, you're just oh, I'm so happy, everything is great all the time. <laughs> but you, you know, you're dealing with with, with the, the balls that life deals to you, or or you, the way you react to them, uh, within a window of tolerance. And when your stress levels are within those the, the window, when your arousal, what's called professionally, the arousal of the sympathetic uh, nervous system is within this window. Your energy level is is within the right level to respond to what is going on, but if you're if if you're not balanced, if what is going on is a trigger for you, either because of some post past trauma, or or because your window is very narrow, or it's just something that you're really afraid of, like let's say public speaking, which is something that a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, your your energy, your arousal level, will just will will cross through the top of your window. And so what we say is using the breathing, and especially with the help of our device, uh, uh, can put your energy or your arousal level within the window of tolerance. So you, you, you do have energy to act, and sometimes your arousal level will go up, and sometimes it will go down, but you will be able to deal with the situation in the most optimal way uh, you can. And then, of course, you feel, you feel better, you feel more in control, and then post situation, you think, yeah, I dealt, I dealt well with that situation. And that gives you self confidence and a sense of agency that will also uh, make you feel better. So that's pretty awesome. And I would think, I mean, and I think I might be cheating because you told me this before, but it sounds like using that device, um, you can reinforce those sort of habits, so you don't necessarily need it every time going forward. True. Um, uh, in our pilot programs, uh, uh, some users say, or a lot of them say, you know, when even when I didn't have the device on, I reminded myself that the, the, since the feeling from the device, and I could use my breathing much more effectively, as if I had a device than with than before I've had a device. So it's actually people by using it, they learn how to use their breathing. Cool. And and, and you know maybe our investors wouldn't. Be too happy to hear about it, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm just cracking, I'm cracking a joke in their expense. I believe that the, a lot of investors are, are, uh, are really, really wanting, really want to give value uh, to the world. You know, we, we also have this impact investment that um, the UN uh, ESG uh, um, uh, causes, and uh, so I really believe that that people and companies and investors realize that that it's better to build value than just to, to you know, to look for for return on investment. Um, I, I went on a tangent and I forgot what I wanted to say. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's so, all good. I, I talked so, to so, okay. so classically, they, they wouldn't be happy to hear that, that, that people can internalize the, 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 the work of the device. So they can internalize the sensations from the device. Uh, and, and, um, and then, and then they are, you know, one, 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 one person that was on our pilot, he said uh, to our clinical director, he told him, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I had something, something happened to me. I didn't have an itch, but then I thought, how would I think if I had an itch nice. on me? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's kind of these things that people say about their guru. I imagine what my guru, how my guru would have uh, reacted. I so, do that with work mentors and advisors sometimes, you know, it's, I'm in a tough situation. Like, what would so-and-so say about this? What about so-and-so? How would so-and-so respond? And then you get this fake committee in your head, but you've gotten pretty good models of those people. So that's neat. We're, that we're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful AIs. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> <laughs> we learn how to, we, we learn things and we put them together. I would say it's, it's a, a real eye. <laughs> real eye, yeah. yeah. Exactly. OI, the, the OG organic, I. In, organic, in, <laughs> or, organic intelligence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Nice. Cool. So, I mean, this is probably a stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway, because it, it seems like it could spawn an interesting uh, tangent, which is you mentioned Anicha being sort of similar to having a cat purring on your lap that's in tune with your breathing. I actually have a cat, uh, which I've never talked about on here, because who wants to hear about that? But um, I'm bringing it up because sometimes if my cat's on top of me, I, I do feel very grounded and happy and you know i think the same like with a dog if you're just petting a, a small animal that only really does you know it's not thinking about you know the taxes it has to pay or you know it, timelines you know three months out or any of that stuff but then i also notice that when my cat's on my lap you know purring and and you know sometimes um I, I get very distracted if i'm trying to plan out my next day so sometimes i'll be in bed and i mean this is maybe embarrassing to admit but a lot of times i'll write out the agenda on a piece of paper for my next day you know as i'm going to sleep and that kind of helps me gather my thoughts and and start to sort of think through how i'm going to get things done and um just wake up you know sort of ready to go as it were and um usually like a few minutes before my alarm and uh when my cat's there i i have difficulty sort of planning out the day because i get distracted by her being there is there ever a danger with a Nietzsche that like somebody might be like a little bit less able to do the positive parts of the analytical thinking in addition to the anxiety causing parts? You know, it's great because if I, if I imagine it uh, right, what you, the, the purring of your cat caused you to actually go under your window of tolerance. Oh, I so see. You, can, you, you can go out of the window of tolerance, but you can go also out of the window of tolerance downwards. And so you don't have enough arousal. You don't have enough cortisol in your blood. You don't have enough, like like what happens to me when I wake up in the morning because I'm a night person. You don't have enough of that um, drive uh, uh, to do what you need to do. But also, you know, your cat's on on top of you. It's pleasant, <laughs> and so you don't want to move. I mean, if you if you stop if you move around and you go to take your pen and paper, or whatnot, you will not get the vibration. And what is nice with Anicca is that you can still uh, get the vibration as you are writing down because it's not a cat, because you don't have to, to, you know, to keep it like this and all of that. So, and this is what we, that's, this is what it's made for. So that's pretty cool. You don't, you don't have to stop what you're doing and then uh, do, I don't think that you can, uh, I don't think that it's, that, that it's a way to dose yourself or to, to, um, to like, um, how would I say? Yeah, I, I don't. I, I never encountered that danger where it will just make you too mellow. Put you under your window of uh, tolerance. To going. That you're under a window of tolerance. Yeah. Well, now that you mention it, I, I do remember a time I was giving a talk for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and this was during the pandemic. So, I was in my home office, and um, I, my cat will often jump up on my lap while I'm working, um, and. Uh, when I was giving this particular talk, she was meowing very loud and, uh, I, you know, but I was laser focused on giving the talk because I'd rehearsed it a bunch of times and I wanted to, you know, execute it correctly. And I mean, there were maybe like 60 people in the audience. So I didn't want to disappoint them. And so I, I just, you know, I stayed focused. It was nice. I still patted her while she was there, but I, I didn't, you know, say, hey, hey, how's it going, little buddy? You know, like I'll sometimes do when she comes up and fully engage her. I just kind of patted the top of her head and continued to give, you know, what I thought was a very good talk. And so not to, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at the end I looked and the ASME presenters had been, um, speculating, is that a baby? Like what's making that noise? <laughs> so it's kind of, it's a cat. Oh, it's a cat. <laughs> so... That's great. This is a very good example. And I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to use it uh, when I explain about the, sure. the on the goiness of Anicca, where you can have this, this background uh, uh, vibration on your body and it's not distracting you enough uh, in, that takes away your brain so you can't focus. On the contrary, it's kind of a, a white noise in the background that, that reminds you that, that of your body, of yourself, of your agency reminds you to relax and also allows you still the headspace to, uh, to stay out with, uh, cool. uh, with whatever it is that you're engaged with. Yeah, and I, I apologize to keep going back to cash. It's the nearest analog I've had experience with at this point. So it's, it's a great example. <laughs> um, it's true. No, no, it's, yeah, 
a good analog. So just to ask, um, what, how'd you come up with this? Because it's, I don't think it would have occurred to me, you know, I don't want to say in a million years, but I don't think it would occur to me in a million years to, to synchronize, you know, a vibratory motor to someone's breathing to try to help them with, you know, relaxation while they're working. I mean, that's and going about their life. Uh, what, I, I guess, how'd you come up with the idea, if I can ask? Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, uh, my co-founder, Yechiel, uh, he, uh, he comes from, we both have a, a, a BA in psychology. Cool. Uh, but he, he, he's, he's more interested in um, mindfulness practices and meditation where uh, sitting in the space with your body and your breathing in the here and now without distractions uh, helps you process things, helps you process your day, helps you process your, the things that are on your mind for the future. It, it's just, it's just like it's a grounding, it's, it's, a, it's a container. And then you're able, you're able, you ground yourself in your body, in your breathing, uh, and, and you, you're able to process what is going on. If you add body scans to it and other, other, other elements that help you uh, that help you train in some things. That's also something that that that's that's a part of it. Yeah. But the but basic the basic is to be in the space of meditation. Cool. And the thing that happens when you meditate is that your mind starts drifting. It's the the default mode network. When we're not engaged, when our brain is not engaged in something, you have this default mode network that just starts conjuring up things and just thinking about uh, things that you need to do, things that you did, and and a lot of the time it involves self criticism. It's called the self-referral system. Interesting. So it's like a yeah, you know, uh, that thing uh, I wasn't too great there, and did that, and that's not gonna work, or is that gonna work? You know, we start worrying. We start. This is default mode network. Um, and and then uh, when you in meditation, or when you're getting into the meditation, you 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 focus your attention on on uh, in in the in the uh, uh, schools that we uh, attend, which is uh, mindfulness based. Um, stress reduction or vipassana meditation um, you focus on your breathing and you focus in your body and 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 then that 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 brings the mind from the default mode network into something in the here and now but and then it stops the rumination we talked about it before um, and then um, uh, but the mind will after a while if it doesn't have new food our brain uh, sorry for all this information no no this is what i asked for. overload this is good. But the, the, the brain, uh, our brain reacts to change. And actually, if you look at a nervous system, uh, any, any cluster of nerves in your brain, um, the moment it gets the same uh, uh, input, it just drops the activation. Those, those nerve cells will stop being activated. Interesting. And so, so it's almost when, like you adjust when, and it doesn't cause you to perk up anymore. I think exactly exactly okay. it, it it really you can say i say i don't know if scientists would say that or doctors or but i say that the our brain reacts to change change is 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 the is what is interesting to a, a an evolutionary brain let's say okay if the, if the environment doesn't change then we're not reacting i mean if you if you if you want to get close to a to a, a prey then you you just pause whenever you think it looks at you you pause it, it won't notice you. And then when it looks away, you get, you get closer and closer. When it looks at you, you pause because it nerve, it's, it's, its nerves will not respond to something that's not changing. And, and so uh, uh, when you observe the breath and you observe the body and, the, and, and there's not much change there, um, it's the, 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 the mind will start going into where it gets food, which is the thinking about things that, that happened or will happen or all these worries we talked about. Which creates change even though it didn't necessarily exist in the present. Exactly. It's exactly. It's, yeah. uh, you can look at it also as, uh, is it regurgitating? Is that the word? What cows do with their food that they bring it back up to chew it again? I didn't realize they did that. <laughs> regurgitate? <I mean. laughs> That's interesting. But, but you know, is that a word or did I invent I think this? regurgitate, <laughs> but I, I think that also just means like to vomit it up. But if yeah, you could regurgitate Regur into your mouth. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of animals uh, would rechew their food when they have time. They would just <laughs> and then they would regurgitate it and swallow it back up again. And and uh, the brain—that's what the brain does. That's what the brain does. And yeah. and so it chews. 
And so in meditation, we, we want to bring back this, this, this focus in the body, this, this uh, uh, thoughtless, not thoughtless, but, but kind of space, in inner space where things, where, where, where things happen, okay? where, where real change takes place, where, where, we, where we change. Yeah. And um, and uh, uh, um, so why we were mm, I forgot the beginning. No, it's of all right. our, I asked uh, you how you came up with a Nietzsche. You were talking about the okay, default okay, okay, okay. network. Thank you, thank you. So my uh, my, my co-founder is a very avid meditator, and he realized that if that his idea was that if we can create something, if he can create something that would vibrate every time uh, you breathe it will give the brain more food uh, to focus on and it will go less into this uh, uh, other space of, of uh, uh, default mode network, etc. And it will and it'll be easier to stay in focused in the here and now. That's, that's it. And, and, and then when I uh, came along, I said, okay, I'm more of a, uh, how can I get the best out of myself? How can I be uh, um, uh, you know, enjoy um, the life more every moment, and 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 get and be the best that I can be in whatever it is that I do. The best in, in the terms of do as as best as I can. Yeah, although I am yeah. also a, a bit. Of, uh, I I do have a competitive streak in me. I like com <laughs> I like the, I like that Same. there's a race. I'm sorry. I I like there, I like a race. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Yeah. It gets, and it, I mean, you know, some of the greatest human achievements of all time have been you know brought about. I think by by that. You know, it's not a competitiveness. Yeah, but then, but then, is it? But like we said these days, is it a part of the solution or part of the problem? Like, uh, uh, like, yeah. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, and and we can, you know, we can talk about it. But I think it's becoming, uh -huh. as long as it's not becoming evil in the sense that okay, I'm trying to, like, I suffer from somebody else's success, or I want to destroy my competitors, yeah. or I do unethical things, or. Or I get so obsessed with the race that, that I'm not able to stay uh, balanced and enjoy yeah, other Yeah, or you hold yourself to life, maybe then... an unrealistic benchmark, like you said, and you set yourself up for failure in your own mind by yeah. trying to compete with somebody that is just way better than you at a thing. I don't know. I mean, or like you're never going to be the best at, at everything or really even at anything. I mean, I, I think, you know, when I was an undergraduate in college, I, I don't remember what made me start saying this, but like, you're never going to be the smartest person all of the time. You're never going to be the strongest person all of the time. You're never going to be the fastest person all of the time. I mean, everybody goes through, you know, sort of waves. I mean, even in professional sports, nobody's ever been consistently the best every single time, you know? And so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's probably healthy to not tie your self-worth entirely to that. But at the same time, I mean, you know, if you don't strive to be better than something, I mean, you know, I don't know if that's much fun either. So yeah, I, it's an interesting philosophical yeah. point. It's a it's a good thing to to strive for something, to have your role models and and to strive for it, but also not not get too neurotic or too attached to the result because that will that will not be nice for your nervous system and it will it will not yeah it, and it's not it's not healthy for your mental uh, psychological. That's, I haven't I haven't thought about this in a while, but but going back to. Um, being an undergrad, I remember there was this calculus class I sat in, and I, I was maybe, I don't want to say I was a slacker, but I, um, I took a lot of pride in not having to show up to class that much and still being able to do well on tests by staying up many, many hours and cramming and, you know, drinking more coffee than I probably should have. And so I, um, I, I would always sit toward the front of the class because I was trying to get to look at the professor to like me and, you know, all that stuff you're supposed to do if you're academically competitive. And there was a guy that sat next to me, and this was maybe like a 200-person lecture uh, at, at a university I went to. And, you know, he would always just say under his breath, and you could hear him, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy, as if to convince himself, <laughs> you know. And, you know, at one time, and, you know, this is like maybe a little bit of a humble brag, but I, I did the sequences and series exam in calculus, and I hadn't attended the class very much that semester, um, but I had attended another class, which was data structures and algorithms analysis. And th there was a very similar thought logic to how both the classes worked. Like it was about um, looking at, you know, how mathematical sequences and series kind of coalesced as you approached infinity. And so with data structures, it was like, you know, if you put like a for loop and another for loop and then do this, that, the other, you know, what's your algorithmic efficiency? But it was, it was just using the kind of the same parts of the brain. So I was able to abstract that over 
and the professor put the distribution of test scores up on the board and I actually outperformed everyone in the class. And I didn't show it to anyone because I didn't want to get lynched. But uh, that one guy that sat next to me that was always muttering about how easy it was saw it before I was able to cover it up. And he goes, wow, this must really be easy for you. <laughs> I remember thinking, dude, I mean, I, I haven't slept in two days. Like, that, wasn't, that wasn't easy. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm kind of off topic. but No, no, it's fine. It reminds me of people, like, you know, our tendency to think that things are easy for others just because they just because we just happen to see them at their best we don't know how how much effort they put into it to get to that spot and like that could get us envious or or uh like for, for no reason yeah absolutely i mean and i mean different people you know like maybe that person doesn't have a social life outside of you know this competition or this sport or this job Maybe, you know, that person is, you know, spending all of their, you know, time and energy on self-education and, you know, coaching and, um, you know, they're building scale models, you know, at home to, to practice the event <laughs> before it happens. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of preparation and planning and work that goes into that sort of competition that I think, you know, it's, it's easy to lose sight of when, when you don't see it. And, and to get jealous or to think that, you know, maybe it's totally effortless. Um, and, you know, even if, you know, like me, you know, you're sort of trying to find sport, you know, at the time, I don't really, I try not to do this anymore, but, you know, I, I think I, I took joy in not having to go to class, but being able to figure it out at the last minute. I mean, even that was taking a toll on the body. That wasn't very healthy, you know, or, or a great way to do it. And, you know, it's, I don't know, it's easy to not see that if you weren't there with me, you know, when I'm, you know, kind of, pushing myself to sleep deprivation induced hallucinations in the library so <laughs> it's a last minute uh, a last minute thing yeah. yeah so yeah no that's that's a cool backstory though it's it's interesting that that i wonder if there's a moment with your partner where he he saw that it actually worked you know or there, there must have been like a like oh my god this actually worked or you know or, we had uh we had so many yeah we had so many prototypes so so yeah there was there was never a, oh my god it's actually working it was like a, oh this belt with all these things tied to it and all these electronics and everything oh yeah it's working oh yeah so, what were some of the iterations you went through to get to the device you currently have okay so so first i'll just complete from from before that i i i, I uh, didn't complete that when i came in it was like yeah this is a great idea dude let's uh, do this. Let's take what's working in meditation and apply it into daily life. So let's take your device and your idea and we'll do it on the go. So the person will be able to wear it and use, apply the same principles uh, of staying focused, staying in the here and now, um, getting out of the things that worry us and being present and showing up um, in, in daily situations, not just in meditation. And this is and this is the complete story of. of my apologies for interrupting that with my story. Not at all. It's a it's a dialogue. Yeah. Well, also um, great memory coming back to that. <laughs> so that's that's awesome. <laughs> motivation motivation stirs up memory. Uh, and um, yeah, so we started out uh, uh, measuring the breath. You know, you can extrapolate the uh, breathing from pulse. So. I don't know if you know that, but when we breathe in, our pulse rate goes up, and when we breathe out, our pulse rate goes down. That's interesting. I did not know that. So, uh, uh, yeah, you need—you really need to be on top of it uh, to feel. I'm not getting a good carotid pulse, but whatever. I believe you. <laughs> you can try later at home. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it's that's that's. Uh, uh, common science to people who who deal with these things, um, and then uh, uh, so so you can w when you go to a hospital and or, or to a clinic and they want to see that uh, uh, get your breath uh, measurement, they just put something on your finger, and that measures your pulse uh, by the by the blood that goes it, it captures the, the the color of the tip of your finger when the blood comes in when you get blood gets pushed. In it becomes redder, stronger, oh. and then and then it no that then just just a simple um, it's a colorometer uh, that's uh, doing all that. Yeah, and and then it's there's incredible. two things. There's one thing measures the you know how they now with COVID 
uh, everybody use these oxy uh, oximeters, uh, oxygen meters yeah. on the finger that it measures. It just I call puts it a out this, this oxygen meter. It puts out the oxygen meter puts out a, a red light, uh, and just the pulse meter puts out a green light, and uh, and then it catches the differences uh, as the pulse uh, uh, as the blood flows in and out. So it knows your pulse, and cool. then. And then, and then by, by measuring your pulse, I know I can know basically more or less how you are breathing. That I know, okay, the pulse is going up, they breathe in, the pulse is going down, they breathe out. So when, when you see, when, when somebody's hooked to, uh, when, when, when you want to see the, 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 uh, the, the, all these machines that, that show you how, your, how the, the breath per minute in the hospital, they just measure your, your pulse. Okay, and, and it's called heart rate variability. Heart rate variability shows you how much your heart rate changes uh, as you are breathing. Or, or, uh, and and the, actually, there's a whole other uh, thing to, um, um, that, uh, to HRV, uh, which also helps uh, uh, strengthen the, the parasympathetic tone in your autonomic nervous system. And in that way, makes you able to deal with stress and with stressors much better. There's a whole training around HRV. And, and, what is, and what is HRV again? Heart rate velocity? Heart rate variability. 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 Okay, cool. So the more your heart rate can vary, the, the, the heart rate variates as, as, as you're breathing in and out. And the, like the deeper, uh, the higher, it, the deeper the amplitude, the, the bigger the amplitude is. Um, the, basically, it means that your your the balance between your sympathetic or, or your fight flight uh, okay. part of your autonomic nervous system and your parasympathetic, the rest and digest part, you know, the, the part that's sitting with the cat on the, on the sofa and doesn't want to get up and, and, and go into <laughs> fight or flight mode, yeah, which is what, what writing down your task for tomorrow will probably uh, get you in a little bit. Yeah. Again, with yeah, everything within sense. the window of tolerance. Yeah. So basically, the deeper uh, 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 your variability of your heart, the uh, the better uh, the better you are, the more balanced you are. Yeah. Uh, so that's just a, a side note. That would be a function of frequency, though, not amplitude, I would think. But it would be yes. how much can you get that frequency fluctuation up, and then that maybe not how much can you get it up, or how much does it go up, and then that delineates sort of the divide between when your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system want to take control of what you're doing just trying to follow i, I want to make sure i'm getting you're it. you're 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 much ahead of me my math you were talking earlier uh, uh just now about uh, taking this math course and this math class and i'm like it's been so i long. really envy you i really envy you because i really sucked at math i'm a programmer by by profession <laughs> but I'm, I'm i'm terrible when it comes to to math i really really i'm just, bad for an engineer <laughs> like, i feel like yeah. in grad school that really came out because uh well, i don't want to go too far into that but I, I i could be better myself well you seem like you you got your thing and and i i don't have math uh so much so so you really got it, and and there's there's, it's really the it's considered today the golden rule or the golden uh, way to measure the balance of your sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, systems, and and you know all these bracelets and these smart watches that uh, you know they tell you okay, when you wake up in the morning, just sit with it for three minutes, let it measure your heart rate variability, and then it will it will. Um, Give you an output of how much you can train today, how how uh, uh, how flexible your nervous system is, etc. I have to admit that I don't, un I, you know, I've, I've heard about it, read a lot about it as we were developing our device, but I, but HRV and, and HRV training and you can train in it and was not our, our focus. But our first prototype did get the the uh, we gave the vibration according to to uh, the. Um, um, uh, understanding what when is it the person is breathing in is when the heart rate goes up ah, okay they're breathing in now and we'll give them the vibrations cool. so that worked that was fine it was like it was an arduino it was a sensor like a ppg sensor connected to an arduino connected to this uh, bell that uh, belongs to another product uh, uh Wooger, that gives vibrations with the music with sounds uh so we, we we did all this thing and then we realized okay yes people 
are relaxing with this vibration uh, uh, somewhat according to their breathing. But then we said, okay, we have to get it more accurate. So we built our own uh, breathing sensor, which is like uh, um, this unit here. Okay. It has a, a force sensing resistor inside and it just uh, measures the movement of your the pressure of the belly against the so that goes on your uh, belt. The device. Yeah, and it goes on your belt. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and 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 then we know exactly we can give you the pulses of a uh, nice vibration just as you breathe in or if you like the opposite some people like it just as you breathe out um, and this and 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 you can you can use just this unit uh, but the thing is that 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 attaches only to your uh, belt or your waistline and so if you don't like the vibration around your belly uh, uh, then you're stuck with it. So what we did is we created, a, uh, and some people don't. Some people yeah. it really causes adverse uh, effects. So we created a, a mobile unit that gets the uh, gets the uh, the um, uh, impulse from this unit, um, and they, vib they vibrate together. Okay, so that's they're like they have Bluetooth or something linking them up. I don't exactly. know what tech you're using, but you've got exactly. one on your belt right now that's controlling the one around your. Okay, cool. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, then I can use just this one, or I can use both, or I can use this one just to measure the breath, and this one to, to get the vibration, depending on, on how I like it. That's neat that it, it comes down to individual preference for what's the most effective. I mean, that kind of makes sense. We're the same in a lot of ways, in most ways, but we have subtle differences. So. Yeah, and that gives us uh, quite a, a product headache because uh, a lot of people just want a couple of options and let it let them you know let them drive and uh, and then we want to give you know because it's such a subjective experience on how you how what kind of vibration you like and how how much you like and the length and the placement etc. So like you know we need to find the the the, the sweet spot or the balance between uh, letting someone really configure their device uh, very optimally. Uh, to just uh, keep the, uh, the default uh, modes and then, yeah. Uh, that makes sense. So it's, you, you're sort of figuring out what degree of configurability to give the user. Um, so it's not overwhelming, but it still allows them to optimize their own experience. Yep. Yeah. You Is there a danger very... at all? And, um, you know, tell me if you don't want to talk about this, but, and we can cut it, <laughs> but is there a danger of... <laughs> um, like somebody like one of those wristband manufacturers like an apple or a jawbone or one of those guys creating an app that sort of takes a similar approach um based around the uh you said hpv hrv hrv my apologies heart rate no that's fine um i, I don't think they can uh you know i don't think they can extra extrapolate the exact moment of inhale or exact moment of exhale. So there's a lag and that's what makes that. There's a lag. There, it would, it, they synchronize with a very specific, uh, very slow breathing, uh, which is called HRV coherence or, or some HRV uh, biofeedback works on that. Like getting the, your breathing aligned with the heart rate variability. So if you, if you breathe and if you do that a few minutes a day or something, you will you will make your nervous system more flexible uh, to stress. Pretty cool. And uh, so in though in this rate, uh, you will get the, uh, the 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 breath with the uh, HRV. You would get the the vibration. But you'd have to train yourself how to breathe and modulate your heart rate in order to make that work. Exactly. And and our principle is we don't tell you how to breathe. We we reflect your breathing, and you can do with your breathing however, cool. whatever you like. If you are a, a breathwork uh, person, where you say, "Okay, I want to control my stress through," I believe controlling my breathing will control my stress levels, which also I do sometimes. Yeah. Uh, then you can use the device to, to to do that and to enhance that. And if you're a mindfulness person, who say, "I just want to connect to my breathing and sense my breathing," you can do that as well. And and I also do that. So it's um. Um, it allows you to do everything, and in regard to your question, so so just by just by by this, uh, I don't think that they can that they can really just by the heart rate variability extrapolate the exact uh, uh, breathing. Um, that makes sense. Would you ever consider yeah. making and sort of selling a peripheral into that ecosystem that works with an existing device but gives additional sensing? 
I think I think in the in the future we would uh, connect to the uh, let's say Apple Health or or or, or the equivalent in Samsung because the, they have such rich data that we don't have, and and by using their data we can give much more um, a more robust uh, platform for the user and give them uh, more uh, data about their mental wellness, um, and so we definitely uh, connect to them, and and yeah we will also at some point probably see if, gener if just using this device and then generating uh, the, the breathing uh, and creating a vibration on the wrist uh, is viable. Um, cool. Yeah, it's a, it sounds like just more experimentation needed to figure it out, but all ideas you've been thinking about. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I mean, once, once, we, once we go into market with the basic uh, thing, we'll be able to, to R&D and, and develop the the next thing we want to do, one of the things we really want to do is uh, being able to turn on the device uh, auto autonomously. Nice. Uh, where the device would sense that your breathing uh, tells it that, that, that it's out of, uh, that, that you're uh, uh, getting out, out of your window of tolerance and start working to help you uh, balance back into it. And, and also with the right amount of, of, of uh, um, intensity. Interesting. For, of the vibration. I almost wonder if you want to use Bluetooth low energy to monitor. Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. Maybe you'll tell me the next, the best <laughs> thing that I haven't thought about and say yes. So, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I mean, it's it's almost like a catch twenty two, right? Because if you're if you're monitoring fully and completely, you're draining the battery, and so. You know, and if you're draining the battery, then you know, it's not going to be there when you really need it. So, how do you monitor without having a huge draw on the battery? I guess is the is the challenge. No, I just, haven't done a whole lot with BLE. What's that? So the the the, the respiration sensor will have the the algorithm inside to know when uh, by itself it wouldn't have to use to be connected to the phone or to anything else. And that's part of, by the way, our our mission is to have the device that to not have to need an application. Um, because if you if you can't use your phone, uh, if your phone's not next to you, if your phone is off or whatever, you can still use the device and get the benefit. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, and then so so yeah, it will have the brain inside and it will be able to say, oh, okay, Spencer is now getting out. He's, he's getting close to the top of the window. Let's start some vibration so he can remember uh, to start coming down. Because once you're out of the window, it's it's more difficult to. To come to bring you because anxiety and stress they they feed themselves right they have sure. a thought and a, a negative emotion turns into a negative thought turns into more thoughts and and, and then the faster you, yeah. you, know, you catch it the easier it is to pull yourself down interesting i feel like the same could be said of like success and and doing well and, and happiness right i mean that's also contagious and self-feeding so i don't know why that is yeah though. i wonder you know they, they they tell you don't let get don't let success get into your head you know all these 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 uh, these sayings are, are are there because they they're based on sensations they're based on real things they say don't get it don't let it get into your head where oh my god I'm, wow i'm so successful. so that can also be uh, uh overwhelming and take you out of your window of tolerance uh in a way and um and they, you know they actually the thing that that, that one of the things is that uh, uh, they cannot tell you whether your arousal levels are, are high because you're happy or because you're angry. Interesting. They're very similar because the, the arousal level is still an arousal level. You, um, that's one of our challenges is to try and see if we can uh, uh, extrapolate it or, or deduce from the uh, breathing pattern whether the person is negatively aroused or positively aroused. Is that just a machine learning problem or how do you go about trying to solve that to the extent that you can say it's a good question uh we're gonna set up a lab uh we we are supported by the israeli innovation authority and nice. we just submitted another application and hopefully if it comes through we'll set up a lab we'll invite people to the lab we'll uh, engage their breathing and we'll uh, while we give them some some psychological ethical uh manipulation <laughs> uh, to, to create a specific uh, emotion, and then we'll see what their, how their breathing is responding. Um, that's one thing, and then and then seeing if we can take it into uh, 
into the ecological uh, level where they actually can we can we replicate this uh, while they're on the go because there's oh, so many other things so many other things that are happening to the breathing and to the so there's a, there's a lot of things that we will need to monitor it, it's a challenge and and we'll have to see how we how we do it if you can modulate all of that or even deduce all of that just from breath i mean that that would be quite an achievement cuz like you said i mean there's there's a lot going on there like i would think and again not not an expert on this so i'm just speculating here but I would think with like an fMRI or something, you probably have a lot more data to go on than you would from from like a rate of breath, breath or a pulse or you know, like any of those variables. Um, and even then, I mean, you'd have to really know what you're doing to interpret it. And so, yeah, if you could figure that out, that would be pretty awesome. And then to take that a step further and to be able to now replicate an emotion by modulating vibration. I mean that. That's so cool. If you can, if you can actually, if you could. What what I mean, yeah, I think I think what I mean is that that being able to replicate uh, um, prophesizing. No, that's not the word. Uh, foreseeing predicting? that predicting that the person's arousal levels are now uh, high because I'm something in the breathing pattern is changing, and so and then I can tell it. I can tell them. I can start activating uh, autonomously. Uh, and give them the and help them uh, balance out. We're not so much. I mean, there are companies that work uh, on uh, on uh, neuromodulating uh, your uh, your your emotions, uh, but we are we are less in that. I mean, I mean, the, the soothing vibrations in a way is is a type of manipulation, uh, but um, uh, we're not we're not into discovering exactly what vibrations would do uh, what emotion so. I see so really it just correlates to sort of your product life or product roadmap and like what features you need to create value for what you're trying to do as a company not you know what can be done utilizing all of the data for any purpose whatsoever yeah it makes sense You've got limited amount of resources you got to deploy them strategically <laughs> We, we are breathaholics in the sense that we really believe that the breath is, I mean, it's also, you know, you always have the breath. And so you, you um, even if you don't have the device, you have your breath. And this is great. And, and uh, uh, like I said before, I don't want the, uh, uh, our future investors to hear that because, they, oh, if so after a month, they will just hang the device in the closet and then they'll never use it again. And, and you know, people who would want to go deeper into themselves after, you know, helping themselves with the, with the, um, with the stress that they experience, then I'm sure they will um, continue to use us and, and derive value from. from yeah. It. Well, I mean, and um, could there even be a different business model there, I wonder, where maybe you, you know, lease it for a month and, and that's, you know, like the initial course of treatment. And then if you want it for longer, you can, you can buy in, but it's sort of a different focus area or. You know, maybe you have a refurbishment program where you get those units back and you clean them up and then you sell it to somebody else for a little bit of time. And, you know, then, I mean, you can get more out of each unit. Yeah, that creates a bit of a logistical overhead as well. But, um, sure. but yeah, I think I think if people if people will, it will then give it to a friend or a family member or, you know, some people will just keep the keep it in their bag for when when uh, a, a, another storm hits or something like that, then, yeah. We're happy to be in that position as well. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you just want to do as much good as you can, which I mean is exactly. I'm not a classical business person, par, you know, par excellence. I'm doing this because I really, I really love uh, psychology. I love, uh, uh, you know, to find out what makes us tick, to reverse engineer, uh, you know, this creature and then uh, fellow, <laughs> and 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 then. I also teach dance. Uh, I, I am a dancer. Cool. I, 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 I teach dance. Uh, I teach dance improvisation. So there's a lot of somatic uh, uh, principles uh, used there to sense your body and sense your movement, and then see what you want to create and how it how it uh, uh, comes out and what comes out. Um, and yeah, what I did is is I reverse engineer uh, what works for me and then create out of that exercises and trainings for my students. 
and cool. and and I love I love this 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 um, uh, you know uh, figuring out what works and how it works and and, and how I can uh, pack it in different ways. And, you know the uh, uh, so this is what I like about about um, this device, and I I and I I would want to you know make it a, into a, a business, of course, a startup, and and. Uh, what we call in the startup world world domination um, <laughs> like to be to really to, you know the the i think awareness self-awareness uh, uh, uh mindfulness mindfulness of of the environment mindful like you said before you were mindful of the fact that that this person or or you're mindful of the fact that that you don't see all the things that, that are happening behind the scenes for this person to be able to show up the way they show up so this is mindfulness, and the more we we cultivate the state of mind of of okay things there are things there beyond the, the immediate story that we have in our head or the immediate emotional reaction. But we say, okay, if I if I look in reality for a moment, I will see that it's a 360 thing and not a 180 thing, and um, and then and then and then really I think this is this is really what will get humanity into the next level. I read a, a, a tweet by Elon Musk just now, and he said, I think, I, I don't remember exactly the words, but I, I think the next step for humanity is being curious, three points. And then I thought, wow, Elon Musk is talking about maybe we should follow our curiosity. I opened the tweet, and he said, curious about life on interstellar, uh, 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 other planets of being course. interstellar, humanity. That, oh, yeah, and I said, and again, I said, of course. And then I <laughs> You know, and, and I think the real next step for humanity is actually to be present more on our planet, yeah. rather than doing the things that we do to it, uh, uh, and and to ourselves and to each other, um, instead of you know finding the, the perfect spaceship I mean, to take off. They're all interesting directions to apply human knowledge and effort into, right? I mean, when you look at the amount of the ocean we haven't even explored yet, or the lack of information about our own brains, given you know that each one of us has one, you know, and I mean, I don't know, also space travel is pretty cool to me. <laughs> like it's all, I feel like there's room for all of it. Like, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. I'm just being lost. No, there's and definitely we room have an infinite for all amount of, of time left to, to achieve and to, to unlock different, different secrets in different areas, I think. Um, exactly. It's like you say, going out and in at the same time. And luckily, there's a lot of scientists who are also researching, researching uh, the brain and, and the inner world. But um, yeah, yeah uh, when I was young, I was doing sports, I was doing uh, uh, martial arts, I was doing paragliding, I was also a paragliding instructor oh, cool. and a they martial arts that. instructor. Yeah, it's really, really great. And, and I, I was doing all these points. And when I was growing up, I was more attracted to dance and art because that was more of a, wow, I have so many worlds inside of me. When I dance, I can portray uh, um, a, an animal. I can portray a mountain. I can portray air. I can portray another person. I can portray cool. parts of myself that don't come into light uh, because um, uh, you know we, we live in a cultural world. But in the studio or on the stage, I can create something, and it will be it it it, it it's something that's desired to be on stage, something that's different. So this is like this is what's been. Uh, catching my me for for the last more than 20 years and 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 it's an endless road that's uh, interesting um yeah. so I, I have a few questions i guess i've got one comment so i found out recently that my dad uh just retired as a surgeon which he did for his whole career but he studied dance in college and i've never really talked to him about it so i'm probably going to call him after this and, and ask him because i'm curious to connect with that part of him a little bit more but the other be thing, very curious to hear. What college yeah. did he go to? Sorry. Uh, I think he was at University of Michigan as an undergrad. Michigan. Okay, I know. I don't know any dance uh, professors there. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you find any through the uh, <laughs> through the pipeline, I think it would have been the late '60s, early '70s, so probably a while ago. <laughs> but that's where where a big, large movement of the improvisation and contact improvisation uh, 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 dance started to happen in the end of '60s, beginning of the '70s. Interesting. So he probably got pulled into that. Uh, I didn't realize the historical significance. That's, uh, that's fascinating. And then the other thing I wanted to ask is, I mean, I guess I, I've gone out dancing, you know, at like raves and, you know, various concerts. And, but I, I've never had any formal training or attempted to do interpretive dance. 
and I know that I feel a certain way, you know, when I'm expressing, you know, my interpretation of the music on, you know, an untrained, you know, sloppy level, just through how I react to hearing a sound. But I wonder, um, like, to what extent are you doing that for you versus the audience? And then if you're teaching your students how to replicate, you know, a, a set of moves, as it were, um, then you're probably allowing them to mimic what you're experiencing there. So how does that equation sort of work uh, from the perspective of somebody that's, that's dancing as a, as a profession and, and doing so very deliberately? So not sure, com not completely sure what you're asking, but, but I think I will try, I will try to answer. And, and understand the really, stakeholders, uh... as we say in, in the business <laughs> world. Uh, no, no, but, but yeah. Uh, um, so, so first of all, I don't, I don't teach moves. I, uh, I, uh, uh, I teach how, people how to invent their own moves great and then and then that's one thing and then the other thing that's improvisation and, and creation etc and then the other thing is that uh, when you're in a in a club and you're interpreting the move i like what you say interpretive dance when you interpret the move you, you let the mu music move you um and and it's mostly a lot of, uh, around rhythm right yeah. so it's like you really you really so that, that's one one level of expression uh, which would be like the time level or the the rhythm level of of, of an experience, um, and 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 then when you do more like um, contemporary dance, you would also use uh, your body to create shapes that are related, for example, for 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 what you are trying to portray. Interesting. Uh, or or you will let your body react freely to to uh, uh, to something. You know, like. And then, and then you can you can depending on 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 what kind of choreographer you are or what kind of choreography you do. So for children, for example, we would do very, you know, I, I wouldn't do, but but a lot of people would do like uh, if it's a children's show, say okay, you want to portray a ball, so now I'm a ball, and you know, and, and, cool. and then but but for more adults, you would want to go more abstract. Uh, so so you can take something if I, you know if I can if I can take some some of the letters behind me and I do a T and nobody necessarily will know that this is a T, but I have some logic of, 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 uh, of dancing the, the letters, uh, uh, behind me and I will, I will create a dance sequence and, and not necessarily, you will not necessarily know what I'm creating, but I will know and I will be in touch. Yeah. And it might, it that. seems like it almost might come across in, in the full scene more so than it would in any particular, um, motion. Exactly. Exactly. That's also part of it. Is what what happens before, what happens afterwards. But uh, um, yeah, it's uh, I, I it's it's so profound. I, I like I I just it's it's endless to discover um, the different ways that uh, using the body to to uh, express uh, uh, reality and realities. Yeah. Well, and it's it's. I mean, so much of communication, too, I feel like is, is nonverbal. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I've been deliberate with that at points in my career, trying to become a better speaker or, you know, understand how to read people better or just, you know, make people feel more comfortable by averting my gaze every now and then when I'm talking to somebody. Mm. Um, and, and that's like one thing. But then to, to apply that to your entire body um, in the form of, of, you know, a dance sequence is something... I'm very interested. I feel like I'm an idiot when it comes to this stuff, and so I apologize if some of these questions. You, you're me. very. I, I feel that you're very intuitive on many topics. You can Thank you. many things that we we discuss. You can jump, you jump right into them, and and you make some some meaning out, out of it, and and that's, you know, very much uh, in in step with aligned with reality. So. I appreciate that. That's really kind of you. And uh, I mean, I the reason I make these podcasts is I like to connect with lots and lots of people at, at this way and, and sort of understand their experience more and, um, and learn from them because you know, it makes me smarter. I originally did it obviously as a, as a promotional piece to, to sort of show off how smart I was and how many people I knew, but that's not why I do it anymore. I mean, at this point it, it makes my day better. It makes me happier and people seem to enjoy it. When somebody says they like an episode, it makes me feel really good. And you know, if, if nobody watched it, I still would have fun making it. <laughs> so that's, mm -hmm. that's what it's become. You would have watched it. I say, in, in dance, I say, when when you do a solo, you're your own audience, and then when you have a duet, you you have a partner audience, because they see you, 
and then we and you have when you put a piece on then you have or, or you perform then you have a audience audience so cool it's the same with with your sounds like the same with your uh, uh podcast how much uh yeah oh sorry yeah that's that's very astute um uh, just to understand interpretive dance more, because this is so new for me. And again, if, if any of these questions are too childish or dumb or like, you know, I mean, I'm coming from knowing nothing about it. Right. And so two things I love talking about is uh, three things, Anicca, psychology and dance. So great. <laughs> well, let's let's keep going. Then. Talk to you all night about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's it's important for the listeners to note the seven hour time zone difference, by the way, from Pittsburgh and Israel. And so, uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's seven hours later uh, in where Ido is than, than where I am. So I'm around 1 p.m. And I think you're at around 8, 15 p.m., 8 p.m. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's, uh, it's a very different time of day. It's actually, we talked about this before. So oftentimes, um, you know, I'll drink on the podcast, but it didn't seem appropriate with Anicca. Just because, like, <laughs> drinking is kind of an escape from, you know, sensation, and Anicca is about deliberate, you know, sensation. So I, I felt like, well, two reasons it wouldn't be. One is I don't want to drink at 1 p.m. <laughs> Otherwise, it didn't seem appropriate. So it lined up really nicely. You know, so it's like, yeah, it works out. It's easy. Drink is, you know, alcohol is easy. It, it works on the nervous system. I mean, I, I don't think, it, yeah, it's running away. I mean, if it didn't have side effects, you know, it wouldn't have been a problem, but the thing you can't drive with it, uh, you can get addicted to it, yep. and um, but otherwise, it's uh, I mean, you can die, it can depress the uh, the brain stem to the point where your respiratory function gives out. And there's yeah, there's a bunch you need of, more and more of it, you need more and more of it to have an effect. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I agree. So, I guess this brings me to another psychological question, just to kind of go the other direction with it, which is. You mentioned the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. I believe, if I'm getting this wrong, correct me, the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight and the parasympathetic nervous system is more a sense of calming and I don't want to say sedation, but I mean, maybe that's accurate. And so are they at odds with each other or is there ever like a situation where you're simultaneously activating both systems and that's a totally different sensation? all the time basically you're all the time activating both systems and that it depends it's like a gas and a brake so it depends on how much, much gas you put and how much brake you put but they balance each other out and cool. i'll give you even something more i think that's less common knowledge we you know we know about the fight or flight mechanism where uh, 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 the sympathetic nervous system is on because something is terrifying for us but actually, uh, 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 when when things are uh, the, besides the fight or flight, there's freeze, and beyond freeze, there's faint, where an animal that will be under a lot of stress, the sympathetic nervous system stops completely, and the, just the parasympathetic system. And I'm 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 sure if, if there's a scientist in the audience or somebody who understands more about it than me, please don't uh, um, don't <laughs> look badly on me if I make a mistake or it's just a metaphor that the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and makes you faint. And then you, you or immobilize you. And that, because the brain decided that's the best chances you have to survive. So in this model, so. basically, the par so the sympathetic is doing its job and that's, you know, you're ready to kick mm -hmm. someone's face in. Then at a certain point, the parasympathetic nervous system comes in and tries to give you a sense of calm so you can handle the situation and eventually cause you to faint. So you are perceived as dead and don't get eaten basically yeah exactly uh i don't know if it's a certain i mean i don't know if it's a, a certain point but uh <clears throat> it will like like there's a balance if you're just jacked up you know you will be so stiff or you you know you won't know anything you won't be able to control so if you have and again this is where anicca or the breath or any of those methods come in yeah. where you are able to getting the parasympathetic nervous system up as well so you can balance out and you that's can, interesting okay, I, I, so they're both working my, exactly they're both working together I found... in extreme cases one one activates i mean if you need to bolt you don't want the parasympathetic system. <laughs> you that need makes to sense. get get out uh, as soon as possible well i i found situations at work at least where you know things I mean, they're not that bad, but like, like for example, like I, I was at an industrial facility a few months ago and um, power went out and we lost a process that was important. And I remember I, um, 
I was overcome with the sense of calm. That was, that was, I don't know why this happened, but I, I didn't feel nervous at all. Like it was almost like, you know, well, let's figure out what's causing this. You know, I, I got very curious and I was just like, okay, how do I prevent this from happening again? How do I fix it? Who do I talk to? Who do I convey the information to? Blah, 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 blah. And I don't know what part of my nervous system was acting then, but it, it felt really good. <laughs> like it was almost like addictive, which maybe this isn't something I want my prospective employers and you know clients to hear that I'm that much of an adrenaline and difficult situation junkie. But <laughs> it's, uh... well, they want you. They, they know where, when to call you <laughs> yeah. when, that, when all hell breaks. Yes. Yeah, but uh, what you, so I think what you're describing is another state of mind that's being explored lately very much, and that's flow. Flow state, flow state is where uh, you're, you're, there's a, a big enough challenge, but it's not overwhelming. You, there's a sense, you're a sen you have a sense of agency, a sense that you can solve it. And so it, it challenges your brain, but it's not a sense that, that of danger or, 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 or that's, that you won't be able to do it. And that, that usually brings us into flow state. Interesting. Whereas if there's too much challenge or not enough challenge, Bam, the, the default mode network comes into play and says, oh, you can't do it, or I can't do it, or, or it just, I'm not interested. That's when somebody throws up their arms and is like, you know, fuck this, I'm out, there's no way I'm going to be able to escape this, it's useless, we're all going to die, this is horrible. And then you increase will, the probability of those negative outcomes by losing control, basically. I will, I, I look at it, I, I will look at it from a standpoint, again, of my dance students, where, where if the task is clear enough for them, and interesting enough for them, they will be in the zone, they will be focused, interested, creating all these things. And, and if it's not clear enough for them, or if they're dancing, let's say, with another person very close, and they're, and, and they're more novice, more beginner, so they don't know, oh my god, there's another person here, and, and they're touching, almost touching it. Uh, uh, and then they, they, you know, they, they will start thinking, and they, they, they would lock up. But then if, if they get, okay, this is interesting, where are they going? Uh, uh, what is the task? Then that's they're in the flow state. So, interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This is maybe a silly question, but do you ever use a Nietzsche in your in your dance classes to help students that are having performance anxiety? Um, no, because it's it's not very. It doesn't work very well in movement because okay. uh, when the body's movement, it. it jacks up the it, it makes the sensor crazy and we, we, we still we still need to handle that uh, but I do I did use uh, I did wear it a couple of times in ballet class for myself so I I, nice. have, I have I have this picture of me jumping uh, across <laughs> <laughs> across with a knee jump in the air. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah yeah I can imagine that would be just a great uh, pitch deck filler for like the tail end <laughs> that's true I wish I had the the courage to uh, to add that to my uh, pitch deck. I mean, maybe I, to the growth rounds. Where yeah, you know, you don't have to obviously, <laughs> and I, I don't know what your investors. I have all I have all the data I need uh, to to uh, get my uh, funding. Now I can do whatever I want in the deck. Yeah, I've <laughs> I've screwed around on decks sometimes where I, I've paid to have a bunch of professional photo shoots of myself done just to help out with you know promotional things here and there and over the years I've accumulated you know a bunch of photographs as a result and so some of them I look more inquisitive some of them I look kind of more intense some of them I look you know like there was a lot of outtakes like there's one that I <laughs> this is going to sound really bad but it's me sort of looking down and I, I just for fun I hung it above the toilet in the office for a little bit and was asked to take it down by a coworker. And removed it immediately because I did not want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it was it was just kind of fun. Yeah. And then I, I gifted it to a relative, and then you know, we hung it up in various places, so it just sort of looks like I'm looking at you. <laughs> and um, yeah. Uh, but I, I can't remember which deck it was, but there was a deck where I, I just had some fun putting various photos of me in different poses <laughs> throughout the deck. <laughs> Context. <laughs> <laughs> did you where you managed did you was it a, like um a fundraising deck or or just a I, I think i was um if i'm remembering correctly it was me um 
interviewing for a particular job, and I was I, I thought it was a little bit silly of, of an ask for me to make a deck on it. So I was I was maybe making fun more than I should have of, of the assignment. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I try not to always do that, but uh, sometimes it comes out. I, um, I I worked on a robotic boat maybe like a decade ago um, that was meant to accommodate an 80 kilogram mass spectrometer, uh, originally designed to go into the Gulf of Mexico and look at like the aftermath of the BP oil spill. And mm -hmm. when we payload tested it, um, <laughs> one of my colleagues made a video. Um, a guy Uriel Eisen, who I've had on the podcast. Um, he made this video of it um, where, you know, it's like, you know, 80 kilogram test and it just shows him on top of it. <laughs> you know, 200 kilogram test and it's both of us, you know, like huddled together on top of it. <laughs> and uh, then he plays this music where it's like, ba, 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 ba. And it's, just, it's just silly. And I, I think that got showed to some investors, <laughs> which maybe wasn't the smartest, but. <laughs> It was one where, you know, it was it was an assignment where we weren't really getting paid that much, so we, we maybe took a little bit more liberty with the uh, ways to amuse ourselves. So. <laughs> Humor and sarcasm, there are things that, that are definitely, you know, you know such, such help for us uh, being human. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I completely agree, and, and I don't know if, like how you gauge culture fit when you're hiring. But for me, a big part of it is that I'll look for people that have a, kind of a, a bit of a macabre sense of humor and are able to joke in difficult situations because I find mm -hmm. that when I'm working really long hours with somebody and, and you really are pushing the limits of psychological endurance when you ask somebody to pull like a 90 hour work week, you know, and, and sometimes you have to in the startup world, as you know, or on a difficult assignment when you're in contract engineering. And I've, I mean, I'm embarrassed and ashamed to say, like, I've caused people to have psychological breaks sometimes by pushing them a little bit too hard. But I try to ride that line of, like, you know, the maximum, you know, that you can get out of somebody without causing them to go insane. And maybe that's not the healthiest, but I've, I've done it before. Um, and then I try to do the same with myself. So it's, you know, and I don't always do that, but, like, it just at times, I, I think, like, you know, when you need that extra bit of endurance to get over the finish line, that's where it comes out. And so, you know, I've learned a few tricks and I've learned how to get really good at monitoring, you know, people's psychological health and then how to quickly give them breaks and, you know, help them rejuvenate and, you know, just sort of help them do their best job without, you know, pushing them over the edge. And so, and one of the ways is humor. So, I'm sorry, it's really long winded, <laughs> but I guess, how do you deal when, with that kind of stuff? Yeah, when when uh, when when it's the same. When I have people do things that uh, you know, it's not it's it's you know, it's not what they signed up for. Or um, I had I had people you know working for Sweat Equity uh, uh, with us. You know, they weren't getting paid, but they were just getting uh, you know, some equity in the company. Uh, and then you know, I would feel uh, you know, <clears throat> I would really feel that I have to do go the extra mile, and I would use humor. I would just make fun all the time you know make jokes and keep keep everybody light keep everybody Smart. Like, this, this is, you know yeah, yeah it's just it's just the way that i deal with it uh, i i i can get you know i can embarrass uh, myself or others with my humor sometimes <laughs> sometimes i just i go over 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 the board uh but then i know how to do the other thing and, and apologize so, yeah i, I think that's trade. a huge one as well and <laughs> i mean nothing costs you less than to admit you were wrong, right? I mean, and it's not always easy to do. I mean, I, I feel like, especially at certain points in my 20s, like I, I didn't apologize for like a few years, which was stupid and, and arrogant and ignorant of me. I mean, but, you know, I don't know. As I got older, I, I kind of realized that, you know, it's it's important. And I think one of the things that helped me was having people that had wronged me sincerely apologize. Like, oh, that really helped to you know, sort of smooth things over and help to get to the next phase of the relationship rather than destroying mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. so, I don't know, that's, that's wise. Yeah, you learn it with, I mean, with the years, you know, you, you, we, we grow up, uh, we already have enough confidence in ourselves. We have a lot of enough years on the planet, still not broke and still not, you know, still alive and still healthy. So we, you know, we, we get confidence and, and, and then we see, okay, we have status. Our status is not. I mean, I can st I can say sorry without worrying about losing face, or like you say, learn from life. Saying actually, 
saying sorry doesn't cost me anything and and uh, and uh, um, friendship remains or yeah hopefully yeah yeah hopefully for sure. i mean you can... there are not too many people walking around uh, pissed off at me yeah but, when i, I uh, you know when i mentioned people that you know had, had had sort of pushed over the edge i mean that was that was more of an early career move that like had happened uh sweat equity played a part in that right when you're having people do things when they're not getting paid it's it's a more difficult motivational challenge um and then i mean obviously when you have bigger budgets for projects or you know you're billing something through to a client you can start to do things with money that kind of help offset the the wear on, on the individual psyche which is nice but it's not infinite. I mean, it, even if somebody's making, you know, like a million dollars a year, at some point they're going to say, you know, like my brain can't handle this anymore. You know, you hit, I don't know if adrenal fatigue is still, you know, a thing, but, you know, you can, you can still wear out. I mean, I don't know. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's a thing about asking people how they are, like checking in with them. You say that you have it like, in, like an objective or an outside uh, eye. But also, yeah, also checking in with them, saying how you feel right now, and w without giving them a door to, to completely uh, uh, decompress uh, or, or go go under the window. You want them <laughs> well within the window. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting, it, it, you know, especially working with dancers. Uh, um, it, it, it happens a lot before performance. Also, with myself working with myself before performance. There's a lot of rehearsals. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of a lot of little details that you have to you know to to really nail in order to have very good performance. Uh, and then yeah, that's when then that's when. Actually, I have a funny story about it. If, I don't yeah, know, absolutely. If you have time, but I don't want to keep you from uh, making your dinner plans. So that's that's my biggest concern here. I, I left a few hours open, so I'm available. No. That, okay. Cool. Um, yeah. No. It, it's. It, no, I just. I don't want to tell too many interesting anecdotes because then you'll edit out all the Nietzsche stuff and then <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the bigger uh, question is we people going to listen to the full duration. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that would be interesting. Um, and um, we were going uh, participating in a dance competition, a choreography competition. Uh, and I was a, a partner with the choreographer uh replacing her partner uh filling in for her partner who was injured uh and we went to germany we went to this competition we went we did the first uh, evening uh and we uh there were two evenings of semi-finals and then one evening of the finals whoever uh, managed to give it managed through the semi-finals and so we managed through the semi-finals we came to the final and i before i was so worried you know going on stage for 20 minutes going going full on uh, uh, wanting to win this prize for the choreographer, for my choreographer, and uh, and I I calmed myself down so much. I relaxed my body, kept relaxing my mind, relaxing my body, relaxing my mind. And then when I went on stage, I was under the window of ah. that was required required to be on stage. I did all the choreography. I learned and performed, rehearsed in a certain level of arousal. And then all of a sudden, I'm like in this meditative, zoned out space where it wasn't with Anita, by the way. Brutal. Asking, it was just something that I was just over. I thought, yeah, the more I'm relaxed, the more I will perform well on stage. But I was too relaxed. I go on there and I black out. It's the worst thing. My worst fear is blacking out, not remembering the moves that we needed to do because, uh, uh, because I was just not in the right state of mind. I was just too relaxed. And it was not the state of mind where I learned the moves. And it was not the state of mind that I needed to be to be alert on stage. That makes a lot of sense. And so we were fumbling. I was fumbling through the choreography, trying to reach, you know, into my brain, what's coming next to that. And then at one moment, uh, uh, there was a point where I was just uh, bumping her on my waist. And then I had to count on the seventh up. I bump her and then I get up I and, and I... I have to, she jumps on me and I ran back to, and, and I circled the stage running backwards with her on my waist. They had, they had really crazy choreography. That's it's, insane. It's a couple. And, 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 um, and I missed, I know, because I was this, in this zone, I was like, well, I'm, what count was it? Seven or eight? And I missed, I missed the count. I got up too quickly or, or I, I, I got up and I didn't have a chance yet to balance myself and she leaps 
on my waist. Oh, and no. I start running backwards like in, in you know, in, in cartoons where we just see. So I was running backwards trying to catch my balance. She's on my waist and we fall. Ah. We fall backwards. And that was like a shock for both of us because like, oh, my God, we just screwed it up. We, 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 uh, that the end, I mean, it was just the beginning of the performance. There's no way we're going to win anything. Uh, uh, everybody sees, you know, it, it's a big thing. And, and, yeah. and that, and she realized, she woke up, she realized, oh, I need to be more present. And we gathered, I, I you know, we both got up immediately. I gathered hand and continued running back towards the stage. And we were then both al more alert. She was more alert, more present. And then we finished the whole performance without any problem but of course we thought that that's like that you know we, we screwed up they saw this they're not going to give us any any prize and we won first prize oh are you serious that's awesome yeah because uh, first of all the choreography was really in line with what this competition was about it was called no ballet and it was uh, uh, about how far away from ballet can you get we don't want to <laughs> see ballet moves etc so um uh so and and their choreography they 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 are based on buto they're based on on very human, creaturey thing. So that was one thing, and then the other thing was I think is that that you know they didn't. Nobody noticed that we fell. Nobody knew that it wasn't part of the choreography <laughs> because it was such a crazy choreography. And 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 we were both very much alert inside afterwards. She was much more. So that put you back in the state that you'd practiced in, unlocked the state dependent memory, and you were able to recover the rest of the performance that way. And and she realized that she has to be more present. So she, so the, the bond between us was stronger. It was very very close, uh, uh, physically close to it. So the bond was stronger, and I think that made it more realistic. So yeah. I, I don't know what what got us the first prize in the end. Probably <laughs> all of or all or some of these elements. But um, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good story about window of tolerance uh, and what it means to be under the window of tolerance. Yeah, and also just to salvage something when, you know, some people I think would crumble in that moment and to be able to gather, you know, back into, you know, the mentality you need to finish out the performance, uh, I guess by bringing yourself back into the window of tolerance almost unintentionally, but then using that to conjure up intentionality. So that's, that's pretty cool. Got kicked, kicked back into the window of tolerance. <laughs> the window of tolerance. <laughs> I, I, I need to, to mention just for the protocol that, that the window of tolerance is a coin, is a, it was coined by Daniel um, Siegel in 1999. Uh, Daniel Siegel is a scientist and a researcher. I think he's a psychiatrist, uh, very well known, and, um, and he researches, writes, lectures, uh, uh, studies uh, emotion regulation. Yeah, that's uh, so. a helpful concept to know about, even for me. I mean, you know, I. I as I'd mentioned, I mean, there's times when I get, you know, nervous and I mean, I feel like being mindful of that stuff is probably a great practice to kind of get better at. And I mean, it's only going to improve, you know, I would think anyone's performance. I mean, that takes the time to, to master it or at least get better at it. Yeah, it's, it's actually, they use it a lot with PTSD when in PTSD treatments, that's where, where it's really been implemented and, and you're to, to, again, to understand where you are in the window and if you are getting close to leaving the window of tolerance. You so I would imagine a PTSD it. patient is going over the top a lot because they're constantly you know, looking out for the next thing that's going to get them. Over the top, under, under the window, over the window, narrow window. You can have, so, so if you don't sleep well, you don't eat well, you don't treat yourself psychologically well, your window will be narrower. Interesting. You know how, yeah. And so even if you don't uh, experience a specific stressor at the moment, you will uh, uh, react to uh, benign uh, circumstances with a lot of stress. Yeah, so, so you can still perform, but your probability of success goes down, is what it sounds like, yeah. because you've got a narrower window. Exactly. So, so if you don't sleep well, your window narrows. If you, you know, all, all these things. So, that's another thing that that can help us, uh, you know, un understand ourselves and and be better to ourselves uh, by understanding where we are on the window. Yeah. And like you said, it's okay to, to sometimes have periods where you're close the the window, or even going in and out of the window. I mean. It, you know, it's life. It's not about like like no, we need to be balanced and we need to ride life in a very uh, 
straight line because that's that's not really being alive yeah that would be very boring i would think and also not really also, realistic at the same time and not being able to you know some some people and sometimes it happens to me uh my girlfriend's like that i hope she doesn't that she really really likes to be uh relaxed and and, and calm and not get agitated and i love to get agitated i mean i love checking <laughs> out the, the, ba- the boundaries the boundaries of the wind yeah it's similar <laughs> Yeah, it's like uh, extreme extreme sports in a way that people with extreme sports they they they, they do that too. So um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it makes, I mean, you want to push your limits. You want to see how much you can you can do, and sometimes that means you know going beyond them. I mean, if you're really trying mm-hmm. as hard as you can, you're gonna you're gonna go out of tolerance from time to time. Yeah, and then you want to be wise about trying uh, about what it means to try the best you can. Yeah. Well, I'm, probably, I'm sure it's like a calculated risk too. Just kind of thinking out loud here, where you know, depending on the stakes, sometimes you probably could afford to go out of the window, and you know, who your audience is, who's around, what's at stake. Um, and then other times, you know, if you're giving like a you know a high value presentation or something like that, you might you might want to ride the center of the window a little bit more just to, you know, ensure success in that mission. A couple of more psychological anecdotes, if you like, sure. if you like them. You know, there's there's a there is a curve of anxi- of the level of anxiety versus the the uh, the performance. A level of anxiety versus performance. There's a curve. I can't remember exactly how the graph is there, but there's a curve. And the more the more you're the more you're uh, there's a level where the more you're anxious, the better your performance. Interesting. Is. But after a certain level of of anxious anxiety, your performance starts to go. So down. it's almost like a Balmer so, peak with alcohol that people talk about for programming, where like you have an anxiety <laughs> peak. <laughs> okay, I don't know that one, but Steve, yeah. Steve Ballmer was the co-founder of Microsoft and and would drink yeah. a lot, and so mm-hmm. his hypothesis was that if you had. <laughs> like somewhere between like a half a drink and a drink, you could improve your level of coding success by, you know, reducing your anxiety a little bit, but not so much that you got sloppy. And so, I mean, I don't know. I, I'd be lying yeah. if I said I hadn't tried to leverage that when I was in school. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know that, you know, it's, it's a healthy thing, but that's, that's what the Balmer peak refers to. And so it, it sounds similar, but it, instead of BAC, you're looking at anxiety as the access to productivity. Yeah, you want to be in the window. If you if you don't have enough anxiety, it's not important enough, or or, or you or or you're psychologically detached. There's dissociated yourself. There's it. So so sometimes you dissociate yourself. I mean, if something is like, and that's again sometimes a post traumatic reaction where we we dissociate ourselves from reality, and we lie internally, subconsciously lie to ourselves that what is happening is not important. You know, maybe you, you were joking, you, you did some assignment um, for an interview, job interview, and you did a, a deck, and in that deck you, you pulled around. Yeah. And in a way saying like, you, you know, in another way you can look at it, I don't care about this job. I don't care enough about this job. Yeah. I'm just going to joke around, you know. And, and in a way it's like, but wait, you know, it's important. You want to get the job. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, so some, sometimes we deny or, or we dissociate ourselves with, with the current moment, and that will drop the... Uh, the level of uh, of, uh, of anxiety would not have enough energy, motivation, clarity, and all these good things that good stress uh, brings us. You know, good stress is needed. Without stress, we would be limp. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and overstress is uh, is also harmful for. Yeah. Yeah, I will add, by the way, yeah. after that interview, I did make it through the next round. <laughs> so, okay. It was it was a seven person <laughs> panel, and they all loved me. So. <laughs> worked out <laughs> but I, I also straight it. acted it so like even though i had you know some silly poses in the pictures i i you know presented it seriously and and you know i was just was using it as game. an example i yeah, didn't say sure. that you were in, in this uh, i was just you probably just showed that you had enough humor uh with professionalism and uh, yeah. yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> i was just i was just using it as an example yeah, no, no worries. So, no, it makes sense though. So, yeah, I, I guess if you don't have some anxiety, then you don't have ownership of the task, then your ability to perform goes down because you're below your window of tolerance. That's interesting. I like that, that ownership of the task, yeah. Yeah. 
what I refer to as giving a shit. I mean, it's it's really it's it's caring about the task and a mission and and taking ownership of it. And that's what it makes sense to give ownership to people. You know, in passion. You think about management management uh, theories and and uh, how people need to know that they are, that they own that whatever it is corner of the project, whatever it is that they're doing, they own it, and in that way, they show up a little different. Um, and like you said, with, with a bit more energy, um, a bit more adrenaline. And, uh, um, I want to, you know, so into a an, another, <laughs> another, another social, another anecdote uh, from, from social psychology, sure. which is called, there's a, um, uh, uh, a, a phenomenon called social loafing, where you would see people, you know, you would see a group of people uh, that they're doing less good as a group, as, uh, um, uh, um, different to if they were measured individually. Interesting. Uh, uh, and we, you know, we, we look at people and we say, oh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, studies that are done like that. Our brain, our brain, uh, oh, there's a lot of people that somebody will do that, you know? So we... we Confusion of responsibility called, is another thing I think of that as. Confused, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, when the when when the responsibility is not clear, when it's shared, then some people will, will pull through, and then some people will take the role of okay, these people are so I can just relax a little bit. And one of the ways they studied is with pull rope pulling. You know how the you know yeah, two groups board. pulling on a rope. Uh. So they measured individuals, uh, individual individual oh, cool. people, uh, how how much when they are measured individually they would pull. Then they put them in a group, and the sum, uh, the, the the group uh, uh, pull, uh, I would, the, the force that the group was pulling yeah. with, uh, was less than the sum of the individual uh, pull. Do you know by what amount, like approximately? I'm just be curious. No, uh, no worries. No, uh, it's an interesting uh, yeah, anecdote, can, uh, though, regardless. And and you know, there's another effect called the bystander effect, where where uh, you know, when when you take a course in psychology uh, 101. They, they tell you about this incident in in, uh, in New York in the 60s. This woman was, was uh, 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 being uh, 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 overrun by this guy, and uh, uh, and she was running through the streets. I don't know what it was, New York somewhere. Probably. I've heard this one. Uh, yeah, and then and then nobody calls the police. I, I don't remember her name, and nobody calls the police. And I think it was was quite like maybe 50 minutes that he was chasing her around trying to get her and nobody called the police and and they 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 made uh, uh, studies after that and they realized that there's another effect called the bystander effect where where every person would think that the other person must have already called the police or or the the emergency responders so Somebody they else nobody does anything this already. Yeah. yeah 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 so it's i think it's derived from the same uh, from the same uh, phenomena that but, makes yeah. a lot of sense i mean i there was a Robert Cialdini book I was reading, I think it was Influence, um, where he talks about, you know, if you're ever having a heart attack, you should single out one person in a crowd and ask them to call in paramedics rather than, you know, just openly having a heart attack. And so, <laughs> Somebody call a doctor rather than, hey, you over you there, you know, Definitely. please call a doctor. Definitely. Ownership, ownership, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, they realize that when people are not looked at directly, then they... Uh, Thing. Yeah. No, actually, I've noticed that in professional situations, too. So there's, um, I won't say where or who, but I will say, like, there was um, a company that I worked at where um, there was, you know, this idea that everybody was supposed to have responsibility for keeping their desk clean and the common areas and the bathroom. And, of course, what that meant is that nobody took out the trash because everybody assumed somebody else would take care of it. And so the garbage would get overrun and nobody would do anything. And then like eventually like, you know, like the person who came up with this directive would have to go and take out the trash personally, even though, you know, they're supposed to be an executive, which is not like a good use of labor parade. It's good to set an example, but if you're doing that all the time, then it gets to be cumbersome on, on a high value, you know, individual. And so it, it was interesting to see kind of that in real life in that situation. Um, yeah, it's always like that, right? And we complain and we, we bitch about it, but yep. this is how humans are. This is how we are. Uh, and um, 
yeah, it's, and that's what I like about psychology is that it studies phenomena and then you know it explains them, removes the judgment from them, uh, helps us become more mindful, um, understand ourselves and others better. Yeah, it's an interesting field of study because I feel like it's inherently subjective because you're looking through the lens of people that were experiencing a thing, but you're still trying to get as close to science as you can, which is objective by definition. So, I don't know. I mean, I obviously have respect for it. I mean, we're talking about this, but at the same time, it's hard to figure out where that line is sometimes. If you get enough people, though, if you get enough people, you become more and more objective. If, if you get enough, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, the number is 80, if you want to prove something, if you want to get a statistical, um, I forgot the, how to say it in English. Uh, Statistically but, but, significant. Significant, yeah. You yeah. need uh, a minimum of 80 people to, to, prove, to show significance. If you get enough people, the, uh, then it, you can look at it as something that's objective. The thing is, I mean, an, an empirical... So that line is 80 people <laughs> that I'm having trouble finding. Again, again, it's, it's like yeah. depends on, uh, uh, on, on, the, on what you're trying to show and how many... You know, if the, the more groups you have, the more different uh, experimental groups you have, the, the more people you need, of course. But, um, and then so when you have enough people, it's like a phenomenon. And you that's can deduce, of course, it would not be true for everyone in every situation. And that's the problem with lab testing is you, you really, uh, uh, it's the, you really control the variables, like one or two variables and everything else is controlled. Uh, and then, um, does that reflect on real life? I mean, so now they're trying to do more studies. They call it ec in, in the field, like ecological studies oh, cool. where, where they do that, the, they try to do that, take the lab setting into the field and, uh, and then look at the phenomena that happen. That's interesting, because wow. I would feel like you'd be introducing unknowns, but at the same time, I have, I have a colleague who also came on the podcast, and she was telling me about some of the animal research she's done, specifically on substance abuse, and mm -hmm. one of the things a lot of animal researchers will do is they'll like pick up a rat, you know, and they're nocturnal, so it'll be in the middle of the day, so she said, imagine getting woken up in the middle of the night and injected with heroin against your will, because that's essentially what we're doing to these rats, you know, oh. so <laughs> in her research, she tried to create a system where there was some um, component of free will by, you know, giving, you know, rats access to narcotics and then allowing them to exercise their own agency and taking them, which I thought was an interesting way to perform the study. And so, I don't know. There's, a, there's an interesting study on, on rats and, and uh, drugs. Uh, I think they showed a, a rat uh, having free access to cocaine. Yeah, I think and that's then, the substance then, she actually was talking about. And then they have free access to activity. And when they had and rats that were exposed to free access to activity, they would not use the cocaine dispenser or, or not use it as much yeah. or, or hardly at all, or they would not get addicted, I don't remember exactly, as the ones that didn't have the activity. And they that would just sense. pump themselves up with cocaine. Yeah. That was also I mean, that's another. Releasing dopamine and norepinephrine at the end of the day, you know? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know your neurotransmitters. A yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm also kind of an exercise junkie, so I, I've been mm -hmm. playing a lot of tennis recently, and I, I find it helps me a lot with stress if I do it early in the day. So mm -hmm. one of the things I've been doing like these past few weeks is just starting my day off with like two hours of playing tennis. And I if I'm stressed in a meeting and I, I jog or bike around the block, sometimes I can overcome a roadblock, and so I don't know. Helps out. You told me that sometimes you would leave off in the middle, or it happened to you that you left off in the middle of a meeting, took a, a ride around the block, and came back. Yeah, right? exactly. And I don't want to identify who the meeting was with, but yeah, I will say I was <laughs> I was unhappy with a particular outcome, <laughs> so I, I I left. I, I said, "Excuse me, I'll be right back." You know, I, I you know closed Google Meets, and then I got on my bicycle. I did a quick lap, and then luckily the other person was still available, and we resumed the meeting, and it went fine. <laughs> so, Amazing. So if you had if you had a Nietzsche with you, you would not have had to go around the block, or yeah. or if you had your breath. Yeah. It, it was six minutes to do that. How long does it take you to get under control with a Nietzsche typically? Maybe that's not the I best way to measure in, success. I but I'm think curious. it's quite. Im it's immediately. It, it works. I mean, you, it works in, immediately. It, just gives you, uh, just allows you to connect, to put your brain on, on the pleasant, 
sensation. That's and cool. Connect with yourself, and then you can balance out. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd very much like to try it at some point. It, it seems like a like a really interesting device. I, I already asked Gal when's the next time he uh, he goes out towards your direction, so nice. I'll make sure that he can, he has a, a device in his bag. Yeah, I think he's uh, he's coming to the studio in person. I believe it's in September. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think he said September. Yeah. He said no point uh, going to the states now. Everybody's on vacation uh, or, <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, and I mean I don't know. The cost of flights goes way up, and you know you have more, you know, BS to contend with at the airport. And I mean, there's any number of things. Although I am so grateful that you know you can travel again because it was getting a little stir crazy there for a while. Hmm. Yeah, and now it's in, uh, they they say that airports are overloaded now. Many many people were, were laid off during COVID, and now there's just nobody there to work, and so the airports are quite brutal, overloaded. Um, did you, know. you uh, did you do? And this might be a little tangential, and we can we can tie it up if you want, because I know you've got a you've got a dinner to get to. All right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. You, uh, finish finish your thought, and uh, then we can. Uh, I, I was gonna. Well, this could spawn into something bigger but i was gonna say did you travel at all like around the pandemic um did you have any any reasons to go out and sort of observe what it was like during that time because it was it was interesting i thought just to see some of the ways different people were adapting me, i have to think about it yeah no worries yeah i'm not sure i don't think i was uh oh yeah yeah we went to portugal last summer ah portugal's great I had a great time. Yeah, last time. and then and and then and in Israel, the you didn't have to wear masks in public anymore, because you know the vaccines were doing their thing. But in Portugal, yeah. people were still in the streets with masks. That makes so sense. That was interesting. I thought that uh, the way different comp- countries interpreted um, COVID was made for some interesting travel, because I remember I I was going to um, I was trying to go to Thailand. I ended up in France because you know, I had to adapt. But um, basically, uh, I, to save money, you know, I, I did this roundabout trip that was a million different stops with you know, some <laughs> arbitrage airline that strung a bunch of different flights together. And I, uh, I went, <laughs> this is so bad, but I was going to, from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, to Paris, France. Uh, then, I can't remember if it was via Seoul or not. There might have been one more stop in Korea. <laughs> And then to Bangkok. <laughs> so I, I got as far as Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Um, I got through customs because um, there was a uh, Border Patrol guy that sort of liked the cut of my jib. And, you know, I, I think you can get away with a lot just by being an engineer and talking about, you know, and some people think that's prestigious. And so, you know, you can sometimes, you know, do things that wouldn't otherwise fly. Anyway, this guy let me right through, didn't even care about any of my COVID testing or. You know, I, I was vaccinated, but they, at the time, Canada didn't care about that. They only wanted mm-hmm. to see uh, a negative PCR test from within, mm-hmm. I believe, uh, I can't remember if it was 48 or 72 hours, but it, they had some window they considered to be good enough, and then that was that was it. And so, basically, I because America just says a negative COVID test, and the U.S. Embassy website for you know travel of all those countries just reflects that language, I had gotten an antigen test, and so... When I got to Canada, I got through customs because the guy didn't care and liked me a bit. Um, and then I, I slept because I had a long layover in Toronto. So I was using that to try to get into, um, you know, like Asian time zone. So I, I mm-hmm. basically went to sleep 8 a.m. and then went back to the airport, you know, like fully awake, like closer to the evening. Mm-hmm. And, and my thinking was this would get me on, on a Thai schedule. And, you know, it was brilliant, except they wouldn't let me into the airport because <laughs> I didn't have a negative PCR test. Oh, man. So, yeah, so it is what it is. Uh, so did you miss your flight? Did you miss your trip? I did, or? yeah. And so I ended up uh, ended up going to Paris instead because <laughs> it, w- it was weird. They wouldn't let me, like, even do a layover in a country that didn't, uh, that, that was okay with, you know, not having a COVID mm. test in Europe. Uh, for the most part, certain countries, you know, had more restrictions, like, I think Luxembourg, uh, I wasn't able to go to because of their restrictions, but then France was okay. I, I spent some time in Belgium, that was okay. The Netherlands didn't really mind. Um, I'm sure Spain would have been fine, although I didn't, I mean, cross the channel, so I didn't find out. But yeah, it was uh, it was fun. 
Spain's hmm. across the channel, right? Am I am I mistaken? My geography might be a little too American here. Across is that, the, the is, English is, Channel? Is Spain in mainland Europe? <laughs> yeah. I'm an idiot. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> my apologies. I, I think I was thinking because um, ah, this is this is me being a moron. But I had to cross the Straits of Gibraltar to go from Morocco to Portugal last time, and I know Portugal is adjacent to Spain. So in my mm -hmm. head, I was conflating that with the English Channel like an idiot. <laughs> so that's, that's what it was. Anywho, it's too middle of the afternoon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's too middle of the night I probably should let you go um, yeah. anyway um, thanks for coming on obviously um, for people listening uh, check out Anitra uh, is there a website or anything else you want to plug yeah uh, we're, we're, we're not uh, for sale yet but we'd love you to uh, visit our website uh, leave your details and so uh, when we are alive e even before we will launch. We are uh, working on, on some uh, videos and explanations and webinars, etc. that talks about window of tolerance, for example, and cool. how to use your breathing to, uh, to keep yourself in balance uh, in different uh, situations in your life. So there's a lot of content coming out uh, that's not that's related and not related to the device. And then when you if you do register to a pre-order list, of course, uh, um, you'll get the dev you'll be the first to get a device when it does come out in, in a few months and, and we'd love to talk to you we'd love to hear uh, we, we love to talk to people that's the most important thing that entrepreneurs can do is talk to people uh, so awesome and what's the website just for so we can post it www.anicha.world uh, it's spelled a n i c c a but it does it's pronounced anicha but it's spelled with uh, double C and an A, so it's spelled like an Annika. Awesome. So www.anicca dot world. Great. Well, everybody, check it out. Anicca dot world, spelled like Annika with two C's. Ito, thanks for coming <laughs> Thank on. You. This has been such Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'd love to follow Thank up with me. you in a few months, and or maybe like half a year, and, and just kind of see what it's like when the product's out in the wild. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. I appreciate it as well. And please don't forget to uh, tell me what your father's, uh, what kind of dance uh, oh. your father was doing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give him a call. <laughs>